Hello, and thank you for coming to today's webinar. We're going to discuss mastering legacy data with graph technology. We will be running a live Q and a at the end of the webinar. If you have any questions, please feel free during the webinar to go ahead and add your questions in the chat window and we will answer them after the webinar. And if you miss anything, don't worry, we'll be sending a recording of the webinar when it's available. So I'm Dr. Janet Six, Senior Product Manager at Tom Sawyer Software. And today we're going to discuss how to overcome challenges with legacy relational databases using graph technology. We'll also discuss effective analyses of legacy relational databases, which in, uh, require overcoming several obstacles, including gaining an understanding of the heterogeneous data stored within, the uh, quality and health of the data, and discovering key insights. So all of these tasks must be accomplished without being limited by the technology that existed at the time the database was designed and initiated. So I have a um, presentation here uh, and we will go to this. So we uh, want to use graph technology to discover and communicate key findings and legacy databases even relational databases. So you can use graph technology, even if you're not using a graph database. And so for example, we have here a crime network and we have identified an important subgraph within our data and key players who are especially important in our crime network. So, for example, if we want to have maximum disruption of the crime network, these might be the people that we want to uh, arrest. Uh, we also can understand where and when the, um, the crimes have occurred, and as well as having some summary charts to show us information about the data overall. So when we're working with legacy databases, there are certain obstacles that we must overcome. So first of all, we need to understand the heterogeneous data in the database. So you may have data that's been collected over many years, or as we'll see today, maybe even several decades. And also you see data that's been collected with evolving techniques. And so while you're doing the visualization analysis of this data, you also need to evaluate the data quality and health to make sure that you are getting the most uh, current and correct information from your data. And you need to apply effective analyses to the data in order to gain actionable insights. So visualization and analysis on its own is not enough. We want to make sure that we are finding actionable insights. Uh, and we need to make sure that we're not limited by the technology which existed at the initiation of the database. We want to have visualization and analysis, which is meaningful for both older and newer data that we have in our database. And then we need to communicate key findings to our stakeholders and decision makers. So today we're going to take a closer look at a micronutrients database. Uh, and this database has 18 micronutrient and micronutrient related categories and 41 indicators that have been studied and 27 attributes for each one of those studies. And as you can see here, we have results for almost 60 years in this database with thousands of results. And by the way, this database is constantly being updated with new surveys that are being conducted. And I have the, uh, the link to this database here. So let's take a look at this database. So for example, uh, we see some of the micronutrients that have been studied. For uh, example, for anemia, there are three different indicators that were studied in the surveys to uh, understand anemia. And looking at some specific results that we have here for hemoglobin, you can see some of these 27 attributes for each one of the studies. So uh, we have each row is a different survey, and you can see what the indicator was it studied, where it was studied, 
uh, what um, kind of location, urban, rural, et cetera, uh, that have been studied and so on. And so we have these 27 indicators, which are scrolled off of the screen. So we have these rows and rows and columns of data, and we're going to apply graph technology today to this data. Okay, and so uh, we have here um, a listing of those 27 indicators, as you can see. So we talked about, you know, what's been studied, where has it been studied, um, but we also have information about, you know, when was the study done, what were the ages studied, uh, statistic results, uh, and so on. Okay, so now, first of all, before we do this, let's talk a little bit about, well, why would you want to apply graph technology to relational data? So, graph technology is more flexible across heterogeneous data. Uh, we also have the capability to uh, federate data across many databases, including databases of different types, some relational, some graph, and maybe you have some data streams uh, as well. Uh, and you can discover more relationships between data elements because you're not limited by the external keys or need to do costly join operations in order to understand some of those deeper relationships that are hidden in relational data. So we need to uh, create analyses that are going to support the, the business decision making, not only the legacy database design. And so when uh, applying analyses to uh, relational databases, especially legacy databases, you might hear from the database administrator, well, you know, we can't get that information from the database. The database wasn't designed that way. We don't have a column uh, in our data that represents that kind of information. Or, or you might uh, want to store some new results or add some new indicators to your surveys. And you might hear the database administrator say, well, there's no place to store that information in the database. Um, because it would be a, a tremendous amount of work to rework the structure of the relational database. And so when we apply graph technology to relational data, and we add that graph layer on top, uh, we now have analyses that are no longer restricted by the database design. So let's take a step back here and talk very quickly about what's a graph. Um, so, you know, graphs, of course, have nodes and edges. This is what's, you know, very commonly known here. So we have the, the circles uh, representing, uh, uh, in this case, we're looking at some banking information. So we have accounts and transactions uh, and then the relationships between them. But actually, you also can do more with graphs. So you can have nested drawings, and we'll take some more um, look at this later today. Uh, you can put an entire graph inside a node. And then you have the information of how these nodes inside are connected to other things outside uh, of that node. So let's take a quick look and see how this works. So I'm going to select one of these nodes here uh, on the right side. I'm going to say expand selected. Show me the nested drawing here. So we open and there's a whole graph inside that node. We also can have labels. So um, we have a visualization here and you'll see that we have uh, labels on the nodes. We have labels on the edges. We have these special connection points. Those have uh, labels as well. We have these special edge decorations. Those can also have labels. And we can use swim lanes for categorization. So we have example here on the left side of one dimensional swim lanes, uh, which show us this uh, category, or we can even have two dimensional swim lanes. So you can have two levels of categories on top of your data visualization. So you can very quickly identify um, uh, uh, elements that have um, uh, or that are in two particular categories and understand their relations to other uh, parts of the data. Okay, so how do we apply graph technology to relational data? Okay, so first we need to connect to one or more databases. We need to create or extract the schema, and then we need to bind data or bring data into the graph model. And so looking at the schema for this micronutrient data, uh, remember we had several micronutrients that were studied and several indicators. And for each 
um, indicator, we had a whole set of attributes and we had some sub attributes as well. So, for example, we had several types of statistics types of attributes. Uh, so there are several ways, of course, to create the schema. Um, and so how do you know what kind of schema that you need to create? So, first of all, you need to know what are the goals of these analyses? And that's going to impact how we choose to create the schema. So today with the micronutrient data, we wanna focus on the ability to categorize the data in several ways to support multiple types of abstraction and also pathfinding. So we're gonna go ahead and keep all of the attributes together in our schema. Okay. Now we're going to bind data to the graph model. So we're going to read information in from our database and we're going to uh, bind it to our graph model. So here we see one of those survey results, one of those rows that we had when we looked at the original database just a few minutes ago. So we have here a particular survey and we can see all of the results associated with that survey and some summary about what was found. And of course we can bring in multiple survey results uh, and of course we'll see more of that as we continue here. And while we're doing that, we should evaluate the data quality and health. So we may have missing data. In fact, as we did with this micronutrient data, or we might have data that appears to be out of bounds. So maybe have um, some uh, attribute in the wrong column or other types of data entry error. So remember, some of this data goes back as far as 1960. So we have information that was originally stored on paper and at some point was entered into that database. So there could have been errors made, of course. Uh, so we need to reconcile or reject data through a very careful process in order to be sure that any corrections or deletions are correct. And then in addition to some uh, types of um, missing or erroneous data, we need to understand the validity of older data given new to data collection techniques. So, of course, you need to have a subject matter expert that's going to help guide you maybe where you need to compute some new values. So, for example, with some of these micronutrients, you know, we might understand 40 years later that we should have a different deficiency cutoff level for this data. Okay, so now that we have the data, there's several different types of data visualization that we can do. So, of course, there's the graph visualization with the drawing. We also have inspector views so we can see many details, the uh, trees so we can see the different results, as well as the tables, and we have charts, maps, and timelines as well. So let's take a quick peek here how this might look. So here we have a data visualization. This one is for a computer network. So we can see here on the left side the tree where we have um, uh, the locations uh, of these different elements in our network. We have a map view which shows us where geospatially uh, these elements are. And then we have the same network shown over here and the logical view. Because sometimes uh, things can be uh, geospatially very far apart, but actually logically they're close together. So it's useful to have multiple views into the same data. And then we have some nice charts and timelines, uh, or excuse me, charts here that show us a summary. Uh, we have the inspector view down here, which shows us details for the selected elements. Uh, we also have our table view to show us these elements again in a different view. And you'll see this, uh, this row is highlighted here. You can interactively uh, select a row and you will be zoomed in to um, the other views uh, for that same element because all of the views are synchronized in perspectives. Um, so let's, uh, let's continue and see what else can we do here with data visualization. So today we're going to uh, look at categorization of the data. So we want to use both swim lanes and nested drawings to help us understand at a higher level what's happening in this legacy data. And also, we're going to uh, briefly discuss computed graphs, and we'll get to that here shortly, what those are. 
Okay, so looking at our micronutrient data, now we've added swim lanes. So we have our survey results. Uh, you can see here we've hovered over one of those survey results. We have a tooltip that's telling us all of the details about this, this survey. And we've added a categorization by year. So which surveys have happened in which year? And here is a example where we've brought in more of the data. Uh, so we can, of course, have many swim lanes, and we see we have many surveys uh, that are happening in the same year. And now we're going to take the same data and we're going to categorize it a different way. So instead of seeing what's happened in a particular year, we can also show what has happened in a particular country. So here uh, we can see that these surveys have been done for a particular country. And now let's talk about nested drawings again. Uh, so we here, we see some of the years that we have brought in from our database, and let's find out what happened in the year 2000. So we're going to go and we're going to select this year, and we're going to expand that selected node, and now we can see what's happened um, in that particular year. And if we want, we can expand many of those nested drawings at the same time. So, for example, we see for this year here, we had a very large study with a lot of results. In other years, we had several small studies, and there were other years that had almost no activity as well. This would be very difficult to see uh, in the original format. So the graph technology is going to give us a lot of information um, with this visualization. Okay, so let's take a moment here to talk about computed graphs. So sometimes the graph in the original data source is not the one that we need to analyze for our use case. So let's take an example here, um, and we're going to look at a crime network. So here is our original data, the criminals and the crimes. So we see we have one, two, three, four criminals that committed a burglary together. And then we have another burglary down here that had a different set of criminals. So again, this is our original data here. Let's say that we want to do a social network analysis to understand who are the people that are working together and who are the most important criminals uh, in our large crime network. So we can compute a graph from the original data. So now we have here the social network for that piece of the crime network that we just saw. Uh, so we see these are the criminals that have worked together on those burglaries. And we have an edge between criminals if they've committed a crime together. Okay, so now let's zoom out a little bit in this visualization. So we can see here, so here's that part of the crime network that we were just looking at. And we know that these criminals have worked together on multiple crimes. But we can see now this person is also committing crimes with people from this crime network as well. And then let's zoom out a little bit more. And then this person from that first part of the crime network that we were looking at, we can see that um, this person has committed a crime here with this person who has another whole crime network over here. So through the use of graph visualization, uh, we are able to see that not only do we have this original crime network, that we also have connections now to a larger, wider criminal network. And so if we have more people from this original group starting to work with some of these other groups, we'll have a much, much larger crime ring. So not only do we see what's going on now, but through this visualization, uh, we can understand the potential of what might be happening. We might have a very, very large crime ring getting ready to grow here uh, with these people. And so bringing that all together, um, here we have the original data for the crime network on the left side. So we can see the criminals and their crimes. Over here, we're studying the social network only. And you can see here that some of the nodes are larger than others. So these are especially key people in our crime network. And so if we arrest some of these people with a larger uh, centralities, we can have a, a larger disruption of the crime network. 
And we've brought together uh, those views with some other views. So we have our map view showing us where uh, these uh, crimes have occurred. We have some charts here that show us a summary. Uh, and then down here, we have something that we're going to discuss uh, more here shortly, is the timeline view. When did these crimes occur? Okay, so now we're turning back to our micronutrient example. We've brought in more data. And so we have this graph visualization and we can tell that there are certain uh, areas of high activity that we should understand more. But let's add even more capabilities to this visualization so we can have even more interesting results from seeing the graph on this relational data. So we are, this is by the way, the same graph. Um, we have taken parts of the graph and we've collapsed them into a nested drawing. So again, we can have a whole graph inside a node. So these blue nodes represent years and these yellow nodes represent groups, study, children, um, people of a certain age, et cetera. Okay, so here uh, we have a bundle layout. Here's the same graph with orthogonal layout. Uh, so when you have different layout styles, even of the same graph, you can see different kinds of information. And when we zoom in here, you can see that we have certain years. There's 1995 where we studied um, some elderly uh, populations uh, in the year 2000. We also had several um, studies there and you can see the other groups here um, with the yellow uh, nodes. So um, we can interactively expand uh, these drawings. So here we wanted to see what happened in the year 2011. We have these four surveys which were done. We have a collection of the results from those surveys. And then we have these special blue dash lines which show us which um, of the, our populations were studied. And here we've opened different uh, nested drawings. Uh, so you can interactively open nested drawings or you can do this programmatically as well. Okay. Now we've taken the same graph and we've done a hierarchical layout. Uh, so here in this row we have um, the years which have been studied and the different population groups which have been studied. So we can see that some of the population groups have had a lot of studies done while there's others that haven't had many. And so maybe we need to go in and do some more uh, surveys studying uh, that particular population group. Okay, so let's see a little bit more how this works interactively. So, um, again, we have um, our drawing view at the top and we have our table view at the bottom. The uh, green means that there was not a deficiency found in that study, but the red means that there was. So we're going to select an item it takes us to that uh, appropriate nested drawing uh, and we can expand that interactively. We have our interactive tooltip here showing us more details about a particular survey. These red nodes uh, are those that have survey results where there is a deficiency level of at least 50%. And again, our views are synchronized. All right, so now um, that was where we expanded the nested drawing in place. But what we can also do is that we can go to the child drawing and see only that drawing. So now we're going to go and see just what's in that DESA drawing. We have drilled down into the data and we can see more information specifically um, about this particular year. All right, good. And then we're going to see interactively what happens with the different layout styles. Uh, so we uh, went from orthogonal layout to bundle layout where we intelligently bundle edges. And then here we're going to go to the hierarchical layout. Again, same graph, the different layouts are going to tell us different things. And we can see in this case, which, um, which populations have had a lot of studies or not. All right, so now what about analysis? So there's different types of analyses that we can do. We can do a visual analysis. We can do data-driven graph analyses. And of course, we can use some AI and machine learning results as well. Uh, so we can apply um, the visualization and analysis um, visually. 
in order to optimize our system. Uh, so here is an example with a supply chain. And so we can see how different parts come together to build larger components, which are brought together to build even larger components. Um, and uh, you can see here that we have a nested structure. So we can see where these parts are being uh, brought together. So which factory uh, are these uh, parts being built and uh, what are the relationships between, you know, we have to take these parts, pack them up, ship them to another location uh, and, and bring those together to you know, build the final product. And so we can do a optimization here um, of our network to reduce vulnerabilities and also to increase throughput. Now, we're going to look again at our micronutrient example. And so this is actually the same graph that we were just looking at, and we have flattened the graph, meaning that we've taken those nodes out of the nested drawing, and we've put them all, you know, into the same level here. And we've done a clustering analysis. So the nodes that have the same colors are more closely related to each other. There's natural groupings that happen in graph technology. So this clustering analysis has helped us to identify that. And by the way, we can take the nodes of the same cluster. We can put that into uh, a nested drawing as well. So we have three ways now to categorize this data um, with the use of uh, those nested drawings. We can group by year, we can group by country, and now we can group by this clustering analysis. We also can use uh, graph analysis uh, to search for vulnerabilities. So, you know, again, we have this micronutrient data. Uh, we see we have some red nodes and we have some red edges. Okay, so what are those? Uh, these are nodes and edges that if we remove uh, from the drawing, you're going to have parts of the graph that are disconnected from each other, uh, which means that maybe we have some populations that are not being studied very much or um, some micronutrients that are not being studied very much. And so this data-driven analysis can show um, maybe how we can make uh, this whole uh, uh, large survey program work more effectively to be sure we're studying all the micronutrients and all the populations that we need to be. Then we can also apply centrality to the same graph. Uh, so you can see here some of the nodes have different colors and are physically larger. So the larger nodes here have a higher centrality. So maybe we have a, you know, some particularly interesting survey results, for example. And it'd be good to explore and understand how these survey results uh, are mapped to other surveys and uh, uh, indicators. All right, then you can take uh, results from AI and machine learning. Uh, so maybe you have um, uh, done some additional analysis and you have some new attributes that are associated with each study. We can also uh, visualize those results as well. And there's also the question of data navigation. So you know, uh, bringing in all of the results at once uh, is too much. We want to have an ability to focus in on certain data. So we can do this um, in addition to the techniques we've talked about uh, before. Um, we can use filters, uh, which you can do on many types of attributes or uh, analysis results. You can do search for certain types of items. Uh, and you can interactively query the database and load neighbors. Um, we also are going to discuss briefly about um, doing data visualizations over time. Uh, so we have here, uh, we're showing how we can search for advanced graph patterns. Uh, we can do this with both uh, Query Builder and with Load Neighbors. Uh, and so here, what we've done is that we have uh, selected some uh, certain products, and we want to look for orders that have included these three products. We also want to load who are the customers for those orders, as well as some suppliers and categories. And you're able to do that type of search without the need to know um, Cypher or Gremlin, by the way, if you're working with the um, uh, a graph database in that case. Now, let's talk briefly about what happens when the data is changing over time? And so here with our micronutrient example, we're studying over decades. So we might want to understand, you know, how is our data changing? What are, what are the trends that we're seeing over time? 
So whenever you have data that's changing, you have the formation of a new graph, to a graph topology, you have new nodes and edges being added uh, or removed, or uh, you might have some updates which need to be highlighted, and you have trends to be discovered. So let's just take a look really quickly on four different ways to visualize graphs and data that are being um, updated over time. So here, we're going to see the graph change in front of our eyes as we're adding new nodes and edges over a period of time. So you can see how um, our visualization is being updated. Now, sometimes you might have the opposite. You have data that's aging out. You only want to look at the most recent data. Uh, so we can also see data being removed from our visualizations and analysis as well. And maybe you don't want to see that. You just want to see a snapshot of what happened in a particular time period. And you get to pick the time period for your use case, a particular year, a particular month, a particular day, a particular hour, whatever the appropriate time period is for you. You can see a snapshot um, and use these types of visualization analysis we discussed today for a particular time period. Now, a fourth way is if you don't want to see the graph change in front of your eyes like this, but you want to understand what happened and see everything all at once. Uh, and so we have a special layout uh, that's uh, called the timeline layout. And so here uh, we are seeing here with these blue nodes, actors, actors in a system and events that they cause. And the events here are in yellow and the edges here between the yellow nodes are showing which event happened in response to another. And the columns tell us what happened on, again, particular month, day, week, hour, whatever your time period is. So we see all of the data, but it's organized in time. And so we can see here, while we're studying what happened over time, we have some additional actors entered the system. So we can see that easily as well. Okay, so once we have uh, the graphs changing uh, over time, we can understand key changes and trends that are happening in our systems. Okay, so now you have your data, you have your graph visualizations and your analyses. So presenting those key finders to your stakeholders and decision makers. It's important to understand who your audience is, create a relevant set of dashboards, and have the ability to interactively uh, show the results and navigate through them. We want to bring human experts back into the equation. So whenever you have uh, these results that you can show uh, to your decision makers and your stakeholders, you might hear something like, oh, there's something interesting here, let's look further. So that ability to show these graph visualizations and analyses can help these, um, these experts see interesting patterns they wouldn't have seen by looking at rows and rows and columns of data, but when they have graph visualizations and analysis, they can see interesting things. So you want to create more value from your data. So the first question is, what type of value are you looking for? And what types of insights are actionable? So you want to create the visualization analyses that answer these questions. So you want to have relevant visualizations and analyses, and you can tailor those for your particular use case with perspectives. And then once you bring those all together, you can put them into a dashboard and you present your key findings to your uh, decision makers and your stakeholders. Okay, so today we've been talking about looking at data um, that has happened um, in the past. We were talking about the micronutrient database with 60 years of data. But all of these techniques that we discussed today can also be used to understand simulation of future scenarios as well that might help you to, in this case, better create surveys that will um, be more effective in the future. Or maybe you want to optimize a supply chain uh, or to understand what's happening in your complex system model um, or in your banking system. So you can use all of these techniques to help you understand what might happen in the future as well through some what if analysis. 
Okay. And I have a couple of slides here from uh, one of our customers, Steve Dickinson, who is the CEO of HubScope in New Zealand. And he's been using Tom Sawyer Perspectives to assist in complex data migration projects for legacy data. So the first thing that he did is that he needed to analyze what was in the legacy data. So here he is uh, showing us some of the legacy data and he's added tags. What is this information that we have here? And then he built a mapping from the old data to the new data. So now we see those tags, which he used before, and he put them in their new destination. And so once he did that with the legacy databases, you know, you can apply that graph technology. Uh, so he can see here um, that he has, uh, you know, some of these visualization type results that we had uh, seen earlier in our presentation today. Uh, we have a special area down here of, um, data that has not been fully migrated yet. So he has a, a to-do list of sorts down here of work that he still needs to do. Um, and he has um, used this technology with the New Zealand Police Association and also the New Zealand Teaching um, uh, Council that has much legacy data. He also uh, uses a lot of pathfinding in his data. And again, once you apply graph technology, um, you're not restricted by working with external keys or having to do costly join operations in your SQL uh, database, uh, and you can more easily see interesting paths. So if you wanna see more information on this, um, you can see our webinar that we did with Steve a few months ago uh, on navigating the integration landscape. We have a recording on our YouTube channel. And uh, so today I appreciate you uh, joining our webinar. Uh, we discussed how to overcome challenges with legacy relational databases using graph technology. Uh, we discussed effective analyses and visualization uh, for this data, and cl um, including the overcoming of several obstacles and the evaluation of data health. Uh, and we were able to use this technology without being limited by the design of the database, sometimes even many decades ago. Uh, so, uh, these results were uh, presented to stakeholders and decision makers in a uh, effective and useful manner for a particular use case. Uh, and I also wanted to thank Max Chagoya. He uh, found this micronutrients database and for many helpful discussions.